All right, everybody, and we are live with yet another book discussion. I do these book discussions on Fridays, the end of the week, sometimes Thursdays if I've got something going on on Friday, but I do these discussions at the end of the week, just a chance for us to kind of talk through a particular book, and we will be reviewing ones that you've probably already read before, and I'm actually looking forward to that. Coming back to things like The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People that you might have read five years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, but coming back to it with your own experience is something that's good. So I'm not reviewing one of those old books today. Today is going to be The Culture Code by Daniel Coyle, talking about workplace culture and how to have the, the best workplace place culture that you can. And so if you've read the book, fantastic. I would love to get your comments. Brian, always good to see you here. Um, if you've read the book, I'd love to get your comments, your questions. Feel free to chime in with any questions about what I'm talking about. How I work these book discussions is I will do a brief summary uh, of the kind of main concepts of the book, and then we'll dive into some areas in the book that I highlighted. Really just little takeaway sentences here and there that sparked my interest and that uh, got me thinking about frontline management and how frontline leaders, supervisors, and managers can apply some of these principles, some kind of aha moments to take away with you. So if you've read the book, great. This will be a great summary and, and talking over the highlights. If you haven't read the book before, it's one that I would recommend reading, um, but you'll also be able to get a bunch of uh, the tidbits out of it by listening to this particular session, watching this particular session if you're on YouTube or on Facebook. So um, with that said, kind of a general, very quick summary, liked the book very much, um, liked what it touched upon. Um, there are a ton of stories in this book. It is it is story rich. And one of my, I don't want to say, I'll say preferences, not pet peeves, is that I like to kind of cut through the fat and get to the meat. I like to, I like to kind of throw the, give, give me the advice, get in, get out. I don't necessarily need the stories reiterating everything over and over again. And so this book was set up with lots of stories, with lots of fat, shall we say. Um, but it was interesting stories. They were good stories. And so it wasn't one that I necessarily minded at all. As we go through it, I'll tell you how to kind of uh, get the most out of the book for the quickest read if you want to skip over some parts. But there were some very good stories on there. Um, Sharon, I'm glad, uh, glad you like it. And I hope you get something out of this session as well. So... With the, the structure kind of being said, the basic kind of cut into the chase, the three things that Daniel Coyle talks about in the culture code that lend themselves to great company cultures are if you can build safety, that's the first concept, that's the first part of the book is talking about building safety and we'll get into some of the details on that. Number two is sharing vulnerability. And then the third thing in the third section of the book is about establishing purpose. Now, this isn't rocket science. When you get into talking about workplace culture, those are the things that really stand out. The engagement and how people get along with one another, and then the purpose that ties everything together. Shab, so good to see you here. I'm glad you were able to tune in. Christine, always good to see you. Um, so getting people engaged, getting the team working together, building a little bit of teamwork with things, and marrying that with purpose is the, the two kind of pillars. Now, what Daniel Coyle does in this book is actually kind of double down. He takes kind of a flipped approach. Usually when I talk about workplace culture, I'm talking a lot about purpose because that's the part that I feel is missing in so many organizations. A lot of companies, even if they have a vision statement and a company culture and guiding principles, they don't necessarily know how to relate those to the work. And so I spend a lot of time talking through purpose and how it applies. Daniel Coyle kind of flips it and talks more about the interpersonal aspects of things and how that drives and helps you put that culture or that purpose in place. So from my perspective, it was refreshing. He takes kind of a different tack on those two main pillars. Um, and and, and I, I found a lot of great takeaways. And you'll see that as I kind of talk through some of these things. So I got my dog-eared copy of the book. It's a little over 200 pages long, and it's a relatively quick read. Like I say, lots of stories, so it flows really well, um, and there's good applications. And then summaries are at the end of each one of these uh, these sections that he has, where you can kind of tie everything together and pull some principles in. Um, but I actually found just as many takeaways from the stories themselves as I did from the summary chapters. The summary chapters are not comprehensive in this particular book. I think there's a lot of takeaways that are housed within those stories that you can get some value out of if you choose to read this book. Um, the, uh, the, the one thing when he's talking about building safety. So you want an environment that is safe for people to 
You, you want to build that safety so that they can be vulnerable. You want them to be safe so that they can express their opinions. They, you want to get, and he gets into some of the psychological aspects of things, you want to get them feeling safe so that they feel comfortable and so that they can turn off that safety mechanism in their brain and get to work. And the word that is used, he, he does a bunch of studies in here. The word they use, high-performing cultures, they use the word family a lot. So it isn't even team. Team is kind of the, uh, the, the go-to word when talking about your employees. I'm talking about my team. The word that is used in high-performing cultures more often than not, though, is family. Um, and, and so we, we start getting into some of those ways that you can actually start building that sense of safety and building that sense of family. And one tidbit, again, these tidbits that aren't housed in the summaries here, but they took away. And one thing that you can use to get better rapport with an individual is if I lean in a few inches closer to you, you might begin mirroring. So, and you see this when you are, say, counseling somebody. Nicole, it's so good to see you here. When you're counseling somebody, what happens? Oftentimes, you tend to stay, sit away from them. You lean back in the chair. It's an uncomfortable conversation. You're distancing yourself from the anticipated reaction. What you do instead is if you want to establish a connection with somebody, you actually lean in closer. And you see this, you know, as far as active listening is leaning in closer. But it's also a way of saying you, that you trust somebody and that they can trust you that you aren't on your defensive and they don't need to be on the defensive as well. So that was just a kind of a, a simple and quick takeaway. Um, and it start, it, you know, stop worrying about the dangers and shift into connection mode. You, the idea is when you're talking about building safety, you get into these neuro, neuroscientific sort of things where you know it, we're human beings. The difficulty in leading individuals, in leading employees, and this is why you'll have people on here from six different continents watching these particular videos, is because regardless of culture, there are these human nature sort of things that we deal with. One of those is change. We fear change because we fear the unknown. Unknown represents a risk, and any of those risks are wired into our brains to be something that should be avoided. So we are naturally not necessarily interested in change as much. We aren't leaning into that change because there's unknowns that come along with that. So we're kind of fighting that human nature. In this case, when he talks about safety, and that being the pillar of a great culture, what he's looking to do is to stop worrying about dangers, building that trust with another individual so you don't have to worry about them backstabbing you, being comfortable enough with them to throw out the crazy idea. You have to establish that comfort and that safety within your group to be able to move things along into the next steps. Um, and so that's just kind of a call out there as far as the kind of neuroscience that goes of it. Um, as far as our brains are concerned, if a social system rejects us, we could die. And so getting back to that hunter-gatherer wired into your brain, the unknown is a risk, and the risk can bring about death, so you don't want the unknown. That's wired into our brain from umpteen thousand years ago. Also, if we get kicked out of our tribe, that can mean death. We don't have the support of our tribe to help feed us, to help, you know, um, you know, find shelter for us, all of those things. And so you have to have that societal aspect of things for people to feel safe and for them to be able to grow and move on. Um, the, the other thing that I wanted to mention on here, and this is a great takeaway for everybody, especially if you're involved with hiring people, if you're bringing in a constant flow of new people, or if you're taking on a new job, the belonging cues sent in the initial moments of the interaction mattered more than anything they said. Talking about um, some studies that were done. So nowhere is that more important than when you're bringing on people. Those belonging cues that you set, that it is okay, you know, you are in the right environment, that you are safe, that you are leaning into a, even a conversation. Those are the things that will make people, that will actually have more of an impact than anything that you actually say. Um, this is so fitting, right? Thank you. <laughs> Good, Rebecca. I'm, I'm glad it is. And, and uh, I'm if you have any questions on it or any takeaways, by all means, drop them down in the comment section and we'll keep going. But those initial, those initial stages, the initial, the, the five seconds that it takes in an interaction has as much to do with how, well, how successful that interaction is going to be as what you actually say. Same with training, same with discipline, 
All right, those first interactions, that's what matters. And then we'll get into some details here on how to make those interactions better and better and better. He's just kind of calling out the importance um, of this. So talking about some tips and tricks on this, he goes into a story here about people that had to, what was it? It was doing a tricky puzzle. Um, so it was a difficult puzzle that people had to do. It was some experiment done. And what they found was, is that after doing the, after about two minutes, if they passed a note and they said, Steve in, in procurement did this puzzle earlier and wanted to share this tip with you, that people brought 50% more energy to it, more focus to it, and had more success in putting the puzzle together, regardless of the fact that Steve's advice had no bearing, no application to putting the puzzle together. That sense that there was somebody else out there, that they belonged to something more than just themselves, had an enormous impact on their ability to actually perform. The signal that you were connected to someone who cared about you had an effect on how quickly you were able to do this puzzle. And again, that advice that Steve handed them, he wanted to give this, you know, this little tip to you, actually didn't have any bearing on what was going on at all. It was the connection that mattered and that's what led to the better performance. Also, with further experiments, talking about caring. And this is why I get the question on here a lot of times of whether it is okay to be friends with your employees. And I always say, Yes, I think it's fine to be friends. I actually encourage people to be friends with their employees, but there needs to be barriers. There needs to be limits. And both of you have to be okay with that. The example I use is you have to be okay being out at a birthday party for one of your mutual coworkers, hanging out with that person, and then coming in the next morning and writing the birthday person up. You have to be okay with that, and the other person has to be okay with that. But the reason that friendships are so important is they demonstrate caring. And in, in the case of Daniel Coyle and the culture code, they help build that safety. They help build that trust. And the example, and I've heard this example used before, the, um, the, the experiment that was done was it was a rainy day and a person would go up to somebody at the bus stop and say, can I use your cell phone? And they had a number of people go through this so they could see how successful they were with a number of different people. Then they changed it. And they said, what was it that they said? I'm so sorry about the rain. Can I borrow your cell phone? And what they found is just by adding that little sentence in, by demonstrating that they, they, they care enough about you to mention it and that they are sorry about something they have no control over actually, they, are four, they were 422% more likely, over four times more likely for the person to let them borrow their cell phone just by demonstrating that caring. And so that's one of the ways definitely that you can establish safety is demonstrate that you care. I use the example before, or I use the example many times, and that is, do you know the names of your employees' children? In many cases, if you ask the names of all your employees' children, in most cases, you'll find that people have kids that you didn't even know about. Oh, I thought you just had one kid. It turns out they have three or four. Or I didn't think you had any kids. And you find th those things out. If you don't know your, your employees' kids' names, these are the people that are most important to them. They are the, the, the one thing that almost everybody would die for is their children. And if you don't know the names of those kids, then you need to be engaging with your team more. Now, obviously there's a line that needs to be drawn there, but demonstrating that caring has an impact on buy-in, how much they listen to you, how easy it is for you to motivate them down the road. These are the things that high-performing teams and high-performing cultures don't have a problem with. And so that's one of those things to encourage you to do is to dive into those methods where you can demonstrate that you care and that the person is safe in the environment that you've set. Um, so they're talking about these um, high-performing um, leaders who create these great cultures, and they're talking about um, Popovich, um, whose first name escapes me right now, um, head coach of the uh, San Antonio Spurs here in the States, basketball team. He always asks questions, and those questions are always the same. They are personal, they are direct, and they are focused on the big picture. What did you think of it? 
What would you have done in that situation? So they're always, you're always asking for their input. You're valuing them. You're asking for it. You're showing them that it's okay and that this is a safe environment because you're asking them for that feedback. And how you react to that will go a long way into pushing that forward and showing that it is a safe environment that you both find yourself in. Um, achieving heavy emotions. I liked also, there was a part in here in establishing again that safety is the, what he called the magical feedback. And I'm definitely using this. So this is a takeaway. If, you ha if you've got pen and paper ready, this is a great takeaway. It's on page 56 if you've got the book with you. Woohoo! Um, and it's when you're giving somebody some negative feedback or some critical feedback, shall we say, throw this in. I'm giving you these comments because I have very high expectations and I know that you can reach those expectations. When people get that as opposed to just regular negative feedback, they have more positive emotions from it and they have better, they, they take the feedback better and use it um, better down the road. But I love that. I'm giving you these comments because I have very high expectations and I know that you can reach them. We'll talk more about expecting the best of your employees later. He touches on that a little bit later. It is a very important aspect of things. Also from a building safety perspective, so much of this, exactly, Nancy, and, and I'm gonna get to some of that too. Um, some of the tie-ins between the book Radical Candor, which we talked about a few weeks ago. If you haven't, if you haven't watched that one, that's a great one. A really, really excellent book that I enjoyed very much. You can check that out. YouTube's got it on there, or you can go back through the videos here on Facebook and see that as well, but it's a good one. And it was something I, I didn't look at, and it's called the Allen Curve. If you want to build safety, if you want to build trust, you have to have that radical candor, but to have that candor, you have to have the interactions. And so one of the, the trendy things, and I, and I hate buzzwords, but when you talk about collisions, that was a big thing over the last decade, the open office environment and making sure that people had to run into one another in the hallway, shall we say. What you get with those, though, is you get more interactions, with help, which helps build this trust. And he mentions actually the Allen curve. And it's studies that were done that showed the frequency of communication with people based on the proximity of their desks. And really kind of the magical spot was about eight meters away or about 25 feet. If you were within 25 feet, you had frequency of 10% of the time you were talking to some, 10% or more of the time, you had some sort of communication with the individual. If it was more than 25 feet away, then it dropped off dramatically. You can kind of see the curve here. Um, it uh, it kind of almost looks like a logarithmic curve. So 25 feet, but keeping people where they can have those collisions and have those little run-ins and have easier flow of communication is huge. Having a centralized break room, encouraging people to go to lunch together, or encourage people to go to lunch during the rush of, of lunchtime is a great way to do that as well if you don't have any control over the physical environment. Um, but I mean, I... Open offices have positives and negatives. I actually kind of almost prefer a semi-closed office with higher back cubes where people can stand up and, and talk to somebody. Um, but you have a little bit of privacy to be able to get focused because that's the downside of that open office environment. But being able to have that communication is huge as far as a cultural aspect. So if it's a culture that is an issue right now within your organization, you may find ways to open up the environment and that's gonna help build that safety which will help you build everything else um, that goes along with this. So moving into chapter six, and this is his ideas for action. And these are the end chapters for each one of these three sections um, that he goes into. And it gives you kind of just uh, the, the, the summary and bringing some of those stories together. And you'll see actually that some of these things weren't touched on um, by, um, weren't in any of the call outs, but he re he's able to reference stories in there to kind of call out the real action points as far as building safety, which leads into the other things that build a great and successful company culture. So the first one is over communicate your listening. So if you want to build trust, this goes into it. You can't be looking around when somebody's talking to you. You know those people that you go to parties and you can tell that they are looking to see if there's somebody more important they should be talking to at that party? Don't be that boss. All right, you want to over communicate your listening. So you focus eye contact. You lean in a little bit more. Um, what I loved in here is that the top salespeople, 
And I, I love this takeaway. The top salespeople in any industry hardly ever interrupt people. I'm gonna say that again. The top salespeople in nearly every industry rarely ever interrupt people. And that's a way of over communicating that you are listening to people. Um, oops, let's see here. Oops. I'm trying to get to the rest of the comment here, Nancy. And it's trying to make me love that comment or like that comment first. I'll get to it here in a second. Um, so over communicate the, communicate the listening. Spotlight, second point here, is spotlight your fallibility early on, especially if you're a leader. If you want people to feel safe in making mistakes, in being not quite up to snuff, then you as a leader need to model this. And this, Nancy, is where I get back into that radical candor. You want to be the per first person to be asking for the negative feedback. So when you screw up, let people know that you screwed up. You know what? I screwed that one up. We should have gone with this instead. It can be a mistake nobody had any idea was a mistake. It can be a mistake that they didn't have any say in. It can be simply a decision that you made that didn't work out the way that you thought it was. And you can say, I screwed up. If you start saying that, if you mention and make sure that everybody knows that you're not infallible, then it makes it much easier for people to admit their own mistakes. Um, surprised, yeah, okay. Yeah, I'm just kind of reading through that breaking them down further into team pods versus seating by function. And you know, Nancy, when we start talking about this, interesting, sorry, it's not letting me see more on that comment. Um, so if you talk about uh, open office environments, collisions, that sort of thing, I do like the idea of team pods. I like the idea of instead of having, um, yeah, instead of having four cubes in an X pattern here, actually opening it back up so they all are you know back to back to one another that helps with communication um, and and still maintain some you can still maintain the same cubes you know high back cubes but you have a little bit of team a team of people so I like that as a, as a nice kind of bridge to a completely open office environment I would definitely explore that Nancy if you think that can help uh, the other thing is you want to embrace the messenger so a lot of times people don't want to give bad news to the boss, not because they think that the boss is going to blame them for whatever the bad news is. It is simply that they don't want to disappoint the boss. They don't want that reaction. And so perfectly wonderful leaders can make this mistake where they're not shooting the messenger, but they're getting the bad news. Oh man, I knew that was going to go wrong, or I knew they were going to do that, or I should have gotten on top of that. Or They're having an over, over, an overreaction to the bad news. And that's not, you know, that's not embracing the person. That's not wanting, making them embrace them. So what you want to do is tone down that reaction, say, thank you for bringing that to me. Now we can go ahead and take it, take action on that. That's a great way of letting people know um, that it's okay to bring that bad news. Because like I said, even if you're a wonderful boss. You're not going to be blaming anybody who shouldn't be blamed for anything. You're not in a blaming culture. Even just your negative reaction to that can be something that's off-putting to those that want to bring you bad news. So tone that down and be sure to thank them. And that leads into the next part, which is lots of thank yous. As many thank yous, as much appreciation as possible for a good job. Great people want to be recognized for their great work. Those that are struggling want to be recognized for the progress that they're making on things. So look for ways to do, acknowledge and recognize people. It was Peter Drucker, I think, who came up with the, you know, you, if you don't have a four to one, maybe it was Ken Blanchard. If you don't have a four to one ratio of positive to negative feedback, then you will be viewed as a negative manager because people remember the bad stuff more than they remember the good stuff on a four to one ratio. So find a way to make to bring recognition to things as much as possible. Couple of things, um, basic things on here, being painstaking in the hiring process. If you're not asking about cultural environments that people have done well in, or how that manifests itself, can you tell me about a time where you had a disagreement with a coworker on something important? How did you resolve that? Well, I got HR involved or something. You know, that might not be the culture you're looking for. But in the hiring process, you need to bring people in that are going to make the culture better. What I tell people when you're looking to hire people, all right, get clear on what it is you're looking for, the attitudes you're looking to see, that sort of thing. 
But one of those overarching things that I want you to know in the hiring process is you should be bringing somebody on that increases the average of skill set of your team. So if you've got a whole bunch of people, you've got a great team that averages out on a scale of one to 10 as far as performance is concerned as an eight, then you need to only be looking at people that are a nine or a 10. Too many, to, uh, that, what that does is that helps you from settling for somebody else. But bringing the right people in for the culture is something that's hugely important because if you bring in a superstar, you see this with the New York Yankees all the time. They, they, you know, they spend more money than any other baseball team in America. They get all the superstars, but they aren't dominant by any stretch of the imagination within the sport. Heck, they might barely, you know, they'll, they'll have a wild card, you know, shot this time in the playoffs. So they won't even win their division necessarily. But the reason is, is because that's not, they, they're bringing people in who are great individual players, but not good team players. And if you don't have a positive effect on everybody around you, you're mitigating your impact. This goes back to the leadership perspective. If you, you know, your individual performance has very little to do once you're a leader with the overall performance of your team, because you have 10 other people, 20 other people, 300 other people that are responsible for the performance. And so your effect on those individuals has an outsized you know, impact on the performance. So look at that from a hiring perspective. I love this one and it's one that's overlooked and that is you need to eliminate bad apples. And, and Daniel Coyle in the, in the book had to tackle it somewhere. Um, but if you want a positive culture, if you want a great culture, you need to have mechanisms of expectations and accountability that weed out the bad apples. And it's happened to me throughout the course of my career, letting people go, not fun, even bad apples. It's not fun to let those people go, but you'd be surprised almost every time you know what, things are so much better now that, you know, Cameron isn't here. I'll use my name as an example. So much better now that Cameron isn't here. Thank you for, for addressing that. I know that wasn't easy and it's terrible for me to say, but it really is better. So many times. And you see, you know, those that have done this, you've seen it. Those that have that bad apple that you haven't gotten rid of, that's going to, you know, that's something that's easy to imagine happening. Find a way to set the clear expectations, work with them. And if they don't meet them, then they need to move on. Uh, but that's something that's important. Um, create the safe collisions, free space or collida, collision rich um, spaces. So look for a way to make sure that people are interacting with one another. If you have a team, if you have a department of 12, you know, 12 people or less, and they aren't interacting with each other, if they aren't interacting with every single person in the department, at least once a day, there needs to be something that's, that goes on to bring them together. If there should be no excuse for a team of a dozen or less not to be interacting with every single person that is there that day, every single day. There needs to be some way of doing that and look for those ways within your organization to create those collisions because that's what creates engagement, communication, teamwork, and that's what builds that safety that Daniel Coyle is talking about here. Um, make sure that everyone has a voice. So are you soliciting advice from people? Are you asking them the questions? Well, what do you think we should do in this situation? That's one of my favorite questions. What do you think we should do? People come to you with questions. You may know the answer, but ask them what they think they should do. A, you might get a better answer. B, you might get the same answer and you can just let them go with it and, and they have that sense of ownership. C, you might get a worse answer, but you can explain why yours might be better so they get a better understanding and you're building them up. But above all of those, you are actually just bringing them into the discussion. You're letting them know that you want their opinion, that it's okay for them to give you your opinion because or their opinion because you're asking about it. Um, the last, or, well, not the last, there's several in here. Um, avoid giving sandwich feedback. Yeah, I'll talk about that here in a second. The other one I liked was pick up the trash. So the example he uses, he goes, back, he goes into Ray Kroc. So Ray Kroc was the um, owner, not necessarily founder of McDonald's. And so, I mean, owns a thousand McDonald's. He's a billionaire. And if he was in a store on a Saturday, he would come into the store usually with armfuls of trash. And it would be, you know, McDonald's cartons and cups and stuff like that. And he put it in the trash. I heard this, you know, JW Marriott used to do this all the time where, you know, the Marriott family, would do housekeeping. 
That, that was one of the things that they would do when they're learning the business. But even when they were executives, even when they were controlling the company, they'd still pick up trash as they're walking around, you know, doing a property site visit or something like that. Show your team that you are willing and you are paying attention to those small menial things. And what that does is that lets them know that they need to be doing the same thing. It lets them know that you don't consider yourself on, up on this pedestal, that you are bringing yourself down to a level where all people need to work, and that is on the basics. No one is lower. That's a, a perfect, perfect way of phrasing it, Nancy. So pick up the trash. Tons of examples, all kinds of examples in here of leaders who picked up the trash when they were going around. And it's simple to see. I mean, you, you, you also have those prima donna CEOs who, you know, whose feet barely touch the ground as they're walking around with their people. Those aren't who you want to be. You want to be with that one that garners the respect and who drives that into the culture a little bit. Um, avoid giving the feedback sandwich. Um, I've heard it, for lack of a better term, called the shit sandwich before. And that is because it's BS that you're putting on either side of it. Um, his leader goes so does seem great great comment nancy um you know you, the sa feedback sandwich if you haven't heard about it is you start out with something positive you give the negative feedback and then you end with a positive note so you open them up so they don't have to be defensive you give them the, the what you need to tell them and then you close with something that ends on a positive note and it sounds fantastic and in practice it's almost an easy route to go but it is a crutch is, is for lack of a better term. I don't like a feedback sandwich. I like you handing out a slice of bread, you know, in the morning, handing out some bologna in the afternoon, handing out another slice of bread in the afternoon when it is applicable. You want to be, oh, you've never heard of that before, Kelly? Oh yeah, yeah, the feedback sandwich. Um, you'll, you'll hear people talking about it, but it's just something that's kind of gone by the wayside is we've gotten a need for more transparency. I don't want that feedback held back. I want you, when you see something positive, to recognize the positive. When you see something negative, recognize the negative. But if you're doing this on a regular basis, then you have nothing to store up for your feedback sandwich, and it's easier to get your negative messages across when they're mixed in with tons of positive messages as well. I don't want to water down the, feed, the critical feedback by putting some baloney or BS, um, you know, positive and BS negative or positive at the end. People see through that. They appreciate honesty. They appreciate that transparency because it's something that isn't always out there um, in today's world. So avoid that as much as possible. Um, the other one is, as far as safety was concerned, he throws this in right at the end. It's all of three lines here, and that is embrace fun. And I just actually watched a TED Talk this morning in regards to happiness. And one of the things I need to dive into this just a little bit more, but it was those individuals that had a positive mindset that were actually 27 or 31% more productive. When you have a positive mindset, that's the power of, you know, having those morning gratitude sessions or, you know, even seeing, we've seen, I've seen this in other studies where they watch like a 10 minute comedy clip and then they're more productive down the road. Embracing a sense of fun actually has a positive ROI to it. You'll probably hear more from that uh, on me or from me um, in the in the days and weeks to come because I'm going to dive into that here just a little bit because I found that very interesting. But the first pillar, getting back to this, if you're coming late, we're we're talking about the Culture Code uh, by Daniel Coyle. He breaks it down into three areas to have excellent cultures. You build a sense of safety, you share vulnerability, and then you talk purpose. And usually, you can kind of break that down into two pillars, really. It's the engagement and the people aspect of things, and then the purpose and what the mission is that everybody is going towards. And I personally tend to actually outweigh the purpose side of things because I find that that's what's most lacking in many organizations that are out there. People try to bring the, the engagement part of the employee experience into, fray, but into, into play, but can't tie it together with a purpose. Daniel flips it around, not, not, not good, bad, or indifferent um, either way. So now we start talking, please state the three again. Yes, not a problem. So you wanna build safety. So that's what we've been talking about up until this point is building a safe environment where people feel comfortable, feel comfortable sharing feedback, know that the, you, are inter you are interested in their feedback, that you've created an environment where they have a lot of interaction with other people because that builds tighter bonds through communication. All of those things, build safety. Then you get into sharing vulnerability. So this is the benefit 
of building that safety, and this gets into radical candor, by the way, this sharing of vulnerability, and then you build that sense of purpose. That's the third part. So safety, vulnerability, and then purpose. Those are the three aspects of it, Nancy. Um, and what you're really looking for here when we talk about sharing vulnerability is you are looking at those ran, ra, that radical candor aspect of things. You want people to be sharing freely their ideas, their feedback, um, positive, negative, whatever. That's what brings those oh, that open communication is that sharing of ideas. The more information that you have as a leader, the better your decisions are. And the better your decisions are, the more successful your organization is going to be. Everybody is going to be. And so you want an environment that, that brings that out as much as possible. Um, let's figure out, right? figure out what, yeah, and that's, that's just it. So when the reason that you want to get that idea is because you're able to, at that point, figure out what really happened and how to get better, whether it's good, bad, or indifferent. We talked about being open, not shooting the messenger, but not even just going that far, but being open to that feedback and toning that, that down just a little bit because you want to get the straight scoop. You want it as negative as possible if that's how it is. You want it transparent. So you don't want people sugarcoating things because they don't want to disappoint you because you're going, oh man, I knew that was gonna happen. You, you have that outsized reaction to it. So tone that down so that you actually get that feedback that you want. Um, from other individuals. Um, having one person tell other people, I, lo I love this, sharing that vulnerability. And this gets back into the fact that you, as the leader, do not have all of the answers because you don't have all of the information that your whole team has. All right, and, and she, he calls it out perfectly here, um, Daniel Coyle in the book. Having one person tell other people what to do is not a reliable way to make good decisions. I'm gonna say this again because it's one of the key, key call outs from this book. Having one person, that would be you, the leader, tell other people what to do is not a reliable way to make good decisions. You need to bring those other people in um, and, and you need to uh, be able to get that information. Now the thing is, is human nature doesn't necessarily lend itself to being vulnerable, to, to that radical candor as we talked about a few weeks ago. Human nature wants to hold something back because there's a little bit of a resistance there. And so you as the leader, to make people vulnerable, you need to be open, A, to your own faults, but B, you have to ask for it. If you want something in life, ask for it. Does anybody have any ideas? Does anybody have any suggestions on how to deal with this problem? Um, all of those things. And getting into um, the, uh, the infallibility of the leader, those might be the most important four, four words any leader can say. Again, the most important four words that any leader can say, I screwed that up. When it's okay that you made a mistake and learned from it, then it's okay for your team to make a mistake, fess up to that mistake, fess up to the bad things that are going on, as long as you learn from it. So very important kind of callaways here as far as the vulnerability is concerned. Um, when you want to make people more, more open to being vulnerable, having that one-on-one -on -one conversation, we talked about one aspect of it before, and that is kind of leaning in. The other aspect of it was being passive and, and not overreacting to negative or positive news. It doesn't mean that you're sitting there stone-faced. It's just that you are not giving them a reaction because when you lean in, you have that mirroring effect. And so if you react a certain way, people will take that in. They'll get those visual cues, even if they do it subconsciously, and they'll change the messaging. So going back to that, going back to these ones, I'm like, wait a second, what was I saying? So, so lean in, be impassive, but the two important qualities, he goes over some super connectors is what he calls them, certain individuals that um, seem to be at the center of great ideas flourishing, whether it was in IBM or whether it was Silicon Valley. Um, two important qualities. The first was warmth. And that's where we get into the caring aspect of thing. You start seeing where these things all start weaving together just a little bit. Warmth, and the other thing was a relentless curiosity. So you want to be warm with an individual to show that you care, which makes it okay for them to share. Then you want to have back that up with the curiosity con to continue to ask questions. That shows that you're listening. So if I had to kind of sum this up as kind of a four-part process, to this 
lean in. Don't be overly emotional, positive or negative. Show warmth and show caring where possible. Nods, you know, smiles, that sort of things perhaps. Um, and then also follow up with questions and curious. So warmth and curiosity were the two common traits um, that they saw in super connectors. And so that's something to kind of think about and, and work on. Now, going through the vulnerability. So we've gone through building a safe environment, sharing vulnerability. That's the other aspect of things. And we'll get into the summary chapter on this, which is the ideas for actions. Make sure the leader is vulnerable first and often. If you want people to be able to give you candid feedback, you need to be open to that feedback yourself. Again, I'm gonna tie this back to Radical Candor by Kim Scott, great book. If you haven't checked out that kind of summary and highlight section that I did, or session that I did, definitely check out the past uh, episodes and you'll see it there. It's worth, it's worth a listen. There's some really great takeaways from that. But one of the big ones was if you want, be, you want your team to be radically candid with you, you need to invite it first and foremost on yourself. And the way that, that she recommends it is, hey, I'm, what are the areas that I need to work on most? Okay, great. Once you finally get something from them, and maybe it is that you just have to suggest it yourself. You know, one area is that I tend to get angry when I get disappointed. So what I want everybody to do is I want you to call it out every time I get angry. Okay, I will not get angry with you. I appreciate the feedback. What are those areas? So you actually seek it out. Um, you seek out people to help you with your weaknesses. Powerful thing to do as a leader. But if you want people to be open to giving you feedback, then you need to show that first and foremost. So make sure the leader is vulnerable first and often. And she goes over three questions that I really liked in here. Um, and it gets, it gets a little bit into those five questions that I always bring up um, as far as new leaders is concerned is, what is one thing that I currently do that you'd like me to continue to do? So what would you like me to continue to do? What is one thing that I don't currently do frequently enough that you think I should do more often? This is on page 159, a great little three-part uh, section. I'm actually dog-earing it right now because um, I want to double back to it. Um, so what is one thing that I currently do that you'd like me to continue to do? What is one thing that I don't currently do frequently enough that you'd think I should do more of? And what can I do to make you more effective? Those three questions. And you'll notice as far as from a vulnerability standpoint, but yes, you're opening yourself up to it, but really it's that second question. What am I not doing frequently enough? That's that criticism, all right? Calling out something that I do well that you'd like to me to see more of, that's, that's a compliment. The third part is something that's practical for you. That's why you're getting something out of it. But it's you'll see where this is a sandwich aspect of things that's kind of good. Um, and that, But it's that second question, what do I not do frequently enough? Maybe not what I don't do, because that's hitting it too hard. This is kind of a soft way of bringing that feedback out. And then really follow up with people um, on it. And that's going to be something that helps out. Over-communicate expectations. Be sure people know. Too many times you've set expectations and people don't know it. I, I ran into this when, when I was managing call centers all the time. We had a stand-up meeting where we went over a whole bunch of information. We posted the notes from the stand-up meeting on a bulletin board. We had it on the SharePoint site that everybody went to for their knowledge base. We put all of that information up on screens that were throughout the call center that were scrolling through. And you'd be shocked how many times, five, six hours into somebody's shift, you'd ask them about something and they go, well, when did you talk about that? everywhere. That's where I talked about it. But people don't always get that message. And so you need to over communicate. What you want people to understand, you need to be able to repeat constantly. You need to be tying it to what they do. Over communicate those expectations because that's when they know where they stand. This, this could actually be just as well applied to the first principle of the culture code, and that is building safety. If people know what the expectations are, then they know where they stand. And that makes them more comfortable and more open to sharing. Um, focus on the two critical moments. Um, so when you're forming new groups, all right, or Nancy, perhaps when you're looking to um, do something different or make some changes as far as the culture is concerned, you really want to focus on two very critical moments because these are the ones that matter. The first time that somebody is vulnerable 
you want to call out that behavior. Hey, I really appreciate you giving me that feedback. That wasn't easy for you, and I appreciate you doing it. That's what's going to help us get better. Really doubling down when they do something well the first time. Tom Peters talks about this. Celebrate what you want to see more of. The first time that somebody does something that you want them to do, celebrate it. Call it out. That's what's going to get them the motivation to do it again. The second critical moment in as far as establishing vulnerability within a, an organization is the first disagreement and how you handle it and do you handle it well. So the first disagreement can be where actually it can be the opposite. It could be a failure or it can be where there is a clashing of ideas. How you handle that, how you respect both sides of that, that argument, what the resolution is and how it's a team resolution, not an individual resolution. Those will go a long way. So two critical moments to focus on. The first vulnerability that people have and the first disagreement. That will go a long way. Um, I also like this aspect of things. As far as when we talk about listening and active listening, you want to listen, a concept I've never heard of, listen like a trampoline. The most eff effective listeners do four things. They interact in a way that makes the other person feel safe and supportive. Okay, so you interact in a way that builds that trust. They, t they take a helping cooperative stance. They occasionally ask questions that gently and constructively challenge old assumptions. So this gets back into those super connectors where they were warm and inviting. That's kind of step two, the cooperative stance. But then they're, uh, they're very curious. They're constantly curious. And so that's challenging old things. And they make occasional suggestions to open up alternative paths. You want the, the result of this is that they aren't passive sponges. They are active responders, absorbing what the other person gives, supporting them in that, and then adding energy to help the conversation gain velocity and altitude. I, I, it, it's, it's a concept that needs to be, I need to explore it further. I'll be completely honest with you. And it would be very situational, but it's a great concept to bring up is that it's not that you're just taking in information. You're taking in information, you're validating and supporting, and you're providing more energy and feedback to actually bring that discussion to move it forward with things. I found that whenever you ask a question, the first response you get is usually not the answer. It's just the first response. And I love that. I found that whenever you ask a question, the first response you get is usually not the answer. It's just the first response. And that gets into that persistent aspect of things as well but look to be more of a trampoline. And that's gonna encourage people to be vulnerable with you. If they leave with more energy than they came in with, that's something that's a positive feedback loop for them. Um, and, but that being said, and they, she goes back on this just but is in conversation, resist the temptation to reflexively add more value. So a lot of times, the first mistake of listening is that you are listening to respond, not listening to understand. So you're, you're so busy thinking about what you're going to say next that you're not paying attention to the listener. The other aspect that she brought in is that you are forcing yourself to try to add value, to draw, uh, add ideas. And what that is, is your then is a reflex. That's a good point, Kelly. Um, you, what you're doing in those cases when you're trying to add value is the same sort of thing. You're waiting your turn to speak. You're like, aha, I've got the value that I can add, the comment that I can add, the story that I can add to this. Now I'm going to throw that out there and that's going to add value, but you stop listening. All right. The way that you get out of that, but still ask questions is say the four, four, four words that they use there is say more about that. So somebody says something, they're talking to you, whatever. Then you go ahead and when there's a particular point that, that could be the crux of it, maybe instead of throwing out a suggestion or throwing out your own story, can you tell me more about that or explain that a little bit more to me? You can, and, that, and these are the, the way you draw people out just a little bit more, and that's what's going to allow you to get more value and hopefully create that trampoline that they're looking for. Um, embrace discomfort. So, Masam, so good to see you. I'm glad you were able to join today. Endure two discomforts, emotional pain and a sense of inefficiency. So there's a lot of emotional pain that comes with opening yourself up to being radically candid, with being transparent, with admitting your own faults on things, that sort of thing. One of the big issues that I see is a, a hyper focus on efficiency and trying to root out all inefficiency. This is what stops leaders from delegating. 
Because you know what? It is always quicker for you to do a task yourself than it is to teach somebody how to do it who is going to start off at beginner speed when you're at any expert speed. That's what stops so many people from um, delegating. It's why people stop from changing is because there's a chance that it's inefficient, that, that there's a chance that the change is going to fail. And so don't get caught and trapped in that concern about a constant efficiency. To move forward, you're going to have to experience some inefficiencies. To move forward, you're gonna to have to experience some of that emotional pain. And so that's just you being vulnerable to the possibilities of improvement down the road. Um, all right, and that's kind of it. So this is, this is I wanna say, the touchy-feely employee engagement aspect of things. So again, talking through the culture code um, by Daniel Coyle. Three pillars to creating a good culture, building safety, developing vulnerability, and then working, uh, establishing the purpose. And so really, I mean, in all honesty, he's, he's separating out a couple because it's two pillars. It's people and it's purpose. And it's working on those pe that people aspect of things that uh, allows you to make most, the most, most uh, to be most effective in utilizing the purpose. I'm gonna get some water here. So we'll move into the third one here, which is establishing purpose and getting into this a little bit. And this is more my wheelhouse. This is what I tend to talk about a lot of when I'm talking about culture um, to organizations, to all of you out there when, when the questions come up. High purpose environments are filled with small, vivid single signals designed to create a link between the present moment and the future ideal. High performance environments tie individual actions, day-to-day -day actions to the higher ideal or the overall purpose of the organization. My recommendation on this, they don't, they don't talk about this here, this one's all mine, is that you simply need to attach a why behind your actions and attach it to higher goals. I deal with this when my, per, um, my personal coaching clients a lot when they want to move up into the executive ranks, when you're talking about moving from manager to director or director to vice president. You have to have a higher vision and you have to see, the way you develop that is by seeing how your actions tie into the larger purposes. So you might have three pillars of your culture or the goals. It might be, we want to increase sales and we want to have phenomenal customer support. Those are the two focuses of our organization, sales and customer support. How is every single action that your team does, how do they support those two things? They usually do in some way, shape, or form. Sometimes you have to get creative. But hey, I need you to do this because this is going to help us have a better customer interaction. That's one of our goals. And so you tie each one of those things to the overarching goals with simply a sentence fragment. I need you to do this because blank. Next, we're going to tackle this because it ties to this. So you talk about the culture and you tie it to individual actions. And as you do that more and more, then the purpose starts flowering and coming to life for people and they start seeing it. it's not just something that's up on a wall. They start seeing how it ties into their everyday actions. Um, the, um, the other one, and if you haven't seen it, the Harvard Test of Inflected Acquisition. I had heard about this, um, I've heard about this for, for years now, but um, what uh, what they did is they went into a grade school. The why, yeah, and that's just it. It it, make, it ties so many things together, not just um, cultural aspects of things. But we're talking about right now. We're talking about expecting the best of your people. And why does that matter? Why do you have to think the best of your worst performer? The reason is is because it actually can come to fruition. The example that's used here is they. Harvard came in and said they, they conducted tests on first graders and second graders. And they, it was the Harvard test of inflected acquisition. And they identified 20 kids in each of the grades, first and second grade, that had high potential for achievement. The test indicated they were high potential and they told the teachers who those 20 kids were. It was over a bunch of different classrooms, a bunch of different kids. And so what they found, they went back a year later what they found is that those individuals that they had identified and told the teachers had high potential 
ended up, what was it? The first graders gained 27 IQ points versus 12 for the rest of the first graders. And the second graders gained, gained 17 IQ points versus seven for the average. These 20 individuals in each grade that were called out. Now, the kicker is the kids were randomly selected. They didn't test anything. They just selected randomly. But what happens is, is when you view individuals as having more potential, um, the, you know, you impart them more warmth. You allow their input to be taken a little bit better. You give them more attention. You're more positive around them. This gets back to that whole positivity thing and how you're 27% um, more productive when you are positive and happy in regards to things. Um, it serves as a locator beacon for reorient. Yeah, it was replacing one story. These are average kids. So you're replacing the story in your head of, the, of your employees are average, which is a new one. These are special kids destined to succeed. And that served as a location beacon for teachers to um, reorient themselves in how they behaved around those students. It's called the Harvard Test of Inflected Acquisition. Boy, that just sounds like a BS part. Harvard Test of Inflected Acquisition, Nancy. You can look it up. Um, but I, I had heard about this ages, ages before. Um, but it's an important point as far as expecting the best of your team. All right? If you want them to be going along with the purpose, um, the priorities, then you need to know in your heart that they can reach those particular priorities. And if you can't, then that's a situation where you need to work clo more closely with that person to be able to build that up in yourself or find out that they can't actually meet those expectations. And then that's an individual that you need to have move on because they can't meet the expectations of the job. Not fun, um, but something that's important um, for you to do. There's an tendency, and this gets back to talking about the purpose and imparting in, in in, and how the purpose plays with people. And, and part of the reason why Daniel Coyle puts two aspects on people and one part on purpose is kind of reflected in this. There's a tendency in our business, as in all business, talking about a business owner, as in all businesses, to value the idea as opposed to the person or a team of people. So there's a tendency in our business, as in all businesses, to value the ideas as opposed to the person or the team of people. So you're really looking for great ideas. You're not as focused as on the team, but this is just something that they just hits home um, here, this, this comment. Give a good idea to a mediocre team and they will find a way to screw it up. Give a mediocre idea to a good team and they will find a way to make it better. All right, I'm gonna say that one more time. Give a good idea to a mediocre team and they will find a way to screw it up. Give a mediocre idea to a good team and they'll find a way to make it better. And I think this was really informing Daniel Coyle's um, focus on those two areas of people first, purpose second. Because if you've got great purpose but don't have great people, they're going to find a way of screwing it up. But if you have okay purpose and great people, they are going to find a way to make that purpose better and have it apply to what they're doing. So getting into the ideas for action, the summary chapters at the end. Um, and so if you have just a, a quick moment with the book, if you don't have a lot of time to go through it, it doesn't take much to get through the book. Lots of great stories, um, good takeaways from it. Um, but you can go to the ideas for action, kind of get some, uh, I want to say 50%. Uh, that's what I would say. The, the summary chapters give you about 50% because there's a lot of stuff in the, in the, other, uh, in the stories um, and housed within those that isn't covered in the summary sections. Um, Name and rank your priorities. So we're talking about purpose here. What is your purpose? People are constantly prioritizing. You are always prioritizing. So name your priorities. Call them out. Put them down on paper. Talk about them. Name and rank them. If Here's the example I use and the reason that you want to rank your priorities is you can give a team or a person five things that you need done in the next week. Now, what often happens in those cases, sadly, is they will only get three, maybe four, but let's say three. They get three of those done. And you'll say, hey, you didn't get everything done. Well, yeah, but I did get three. But what invariably what they didn't do was the top two priorities or the top two of the top three priorities because those are the ones that took the most effort. They took the most work. And so you want to rank your priorities. So name them first and then rank them. That's the first step. You can, you can come up with flowery mission statements and stuff like that all you want, but priorities are really the heart of what that mission statement is. Be 10 times as clear about your priorities as you think you should be. 
all right? And that's part of the reason to rank them, and that's part of the reason that you want to talk about them. So once you've established your priorities, once you've established your purpose, then you talk about it with those sen that sentence fragment that I talked about. Because blank. I need you to answer the phone within three rings because that shows the customer that we value them. That's just one aspect in it. But it gives a sense, that gives in a sense of importance. It ties it to one of those overall our, all missions. We want, to, I need you to take out the trash because the vice president's coming by here in another 30 minutes. If I just told you to take out the trash, you'd be like, what the heck? But I gave you a purpose and a reason and why it's important. Now it matters. It doesn't tie to an overall arching purpose, but that's the reason that those why statements, those sentence fragments, because blank, are so important because it brings that purpose alive. There's a, a great study in here. Inc. Magazine asked executives at 600 companies to estimate the percentage of their workforce who could name the company's top three priorities. 600 companies. The executives predicted that 64% would be able to name them. All right, and this gets into you as a leader. This doesn't have to be executives at big companies, and Inc. Inc. wasn't probably looking at 600 big companies, and probably medium-sized and small-sized companies. But this goes for you in leadership as well, because I've seen this over and over and over again in organizations. When asked, they thought 64% of the team members would be able to name the top three priorities. When Inc. then asked the employees, the or the employees to name the priorities, only 2% could do so. Only one in 50 people could name the top three priorities of the company. That's the importance of having that purpose, calling it out and, and naming it, ranking it, whatever you want to call it, um, call it. You want to focus on, let's see here. You want to focus on the call it bar setting behavior. So it isn't necessarily, the example they use is back checking, back checking in, in hockey. I could use the example of the trash that was brought up in the other section. Um, Ray Kroc, billionaire, owns a thousand McDonald's, picking up trash every time he walks into one of his, his um, restaurants. You want to look for bar checking behavior. Answering that phone within three rings. That's a commitment to a customer. Picking up the trash when you're walking through your hotel. Again, years in hospitality and that was always a lesson that was learned. Those are the behaviors that are bar setting. Okay, we always do this. And if we're willing to do this, if we're willing to pick up trash when we're in a rush to a meeting, then how much more important is it for us to get the right information for a report, have a smile for a customer? If you get those certain bar setting behaviors set right, then it makes everything else easier to do. So kind of it kind of finishes up there relatively quickly as far as purpose is concerned. But the Culture Code, a book I can definitely recommend. You can kind of parse it just a little bit by getting into the ideas for action. Um, that can be something that uh, that speeds it along, but there's a ton of good stories in there. A lot, it makes it a much easier read. I think it's 230 pages, but it moves moves by pretty quickly there. You can probably tackle it in probably five hours or so um, if you read an average pace. But really good takeaways. Build safety, make people feel comfortable that they're at work, open them up to vulnerability by being vulnerable first as a leader, and then tie their actions to a sense of purpose by naming the priorities and using those because sentence fragments. That's the way to build that high-performing culture that at least makes a much healthier culture. A lot of other details is uh, we've gone for just a little over an hour here, um, but uh, really good book. I, w I recommend checking it out, but you can always just go back and watch this hour um, and uh, you can get to at least my call outs and my highlights from it. Oh, um, next week, next Friday, an old classic, The Five Dysfunctions of a Team by Patrick Lencioni. I have not read that book in 15 years, so I am going to come back to it and we will see um, what we're able to pull out of that particular book, but I know it's going to be a, a great discussion because that's, uh, that's one of those classic tomes of leadership. And so if you haven't read it in a while, like I say, I haven't read it in 15 years, so we'll come to it with some new insights, some new experiences, and a new frame of reference for it as well, and I know it's going to be valuable for us. So thanks to everybody for tuning in. You have a good long weekend as well, Nancy, and I will see everybody around. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.